Hello. Hello. Yay, it works. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Love You Like Crazy, the podcast where we talk about young adult fiction. Uh, my co-host, Carrie, will join us just after the introduction. She is taking care of a baby right now, but she will join us shortly. And we also have a special guest, Rachel Barron Singer, who is going to join us to talk about this week's book, which is The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. And so we're going to talk a lot of spoilers about the book. There will probably be some swearing. So if you want to read the book without spoilers, you should stop this podcast and do that now and then start it up again. Or if you don't care about spoilers, you can just listen to it now. Uh, and my guess is you probably read it when you were 11 anyway. And next week, we're going to talk about a book called Shiver, which is the first book in the Wolves of Mercy Falls series by Maggie Steifvater. So if you want to get a jump on that, you can read that too. We're going to talk about a book. Can we talk about a book? I really want to talk about this book. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So what do you want to say, Carrie? Why do I love this book so much? It's really flawed. And yet really, really, really wonderful all at the same time. And man, Westing is a really shitty ex-husband. That's what I have to say about this book. That is true. I mean, okay, so Crow maybe didn't do the best thing in trying to get her daughter to marry this guy. But like setting up this whole game basically as a gotcha to her was sort of creepy and weird. Well, and he had the uh, pi that private investigator keep an eye on her for, it seems like, multiple years. Yeah. And so, you know, she's obviously not doing her best. And he's just like, eh, let me just, uh, you know, check on her, but not, you know, help her. Would have been nice earlier. I don't know. What do you think? What do you guys think? Yeah, I, you know, I hadn't read this book in 22 years. Um, I read it in fifth grade. I think I probably read it in sixth, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, we actually, everybody in my class was assigned a different character to be. And I got to be Turtle, which I was like so honored at the time. And now like going back and reading it, I'm like, oh, of course they cast like me as the Jewish bratty kid. Like that makes <laughs> sense. But... Yeah, I you know, so I I remembered certain things about the book and there were certain things I didn't remember about the book. I didn't really remember who the target was or why the game had been set up, but I did remember the sort of north, south, east, west element and that Sandy and Barney and all of those characters were actually Sam Westing. So it was sort of rediscovering it as I read through it that, you know, the whole you know, who got, you know, you know, gotcha, who did it kind of moment almost seemed like a MacGuffin that was just sort of keeping the story going. It didn't. And that might be because I'd already read it before. And I, you know, there were certain things that I obviously latched onto and certain things that had obviously left my memory. But mm -hmm. it was sort of interesting how I was sort of more focused on the character's and how they were reacting to things than I really was the actual reveal, which is not normal for me in mysteries. I really like the reveal, but in this case, I that was like sort of, you know, off on the side for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think the characters are a strong point of the, you know, of the book. Um, and then, you know, as you say, like, it's kind of set up as this mystery, but exactly what the mystery even is, isn't very clear until pretty much the end uh, because it's set up as kind of a murder mystery, but there actually, it hasn't been a murder or anything. Right. Really the, the only person who seems to have a pretty good idea of what's going on is the judge. Um, and turtle doesn't figure it out until the pretty much the end, but the, it, it's kind of interesting to see the characters and how they develop and where they end up. Um, I was wondering, did you ha did either of you had a have a favorite character or a favorite team up? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, 
I mean, I love Turtle because she's Turtle, because she's this, you know, bratty little kid. Um, so, of course, I, I, I feel for her. Um, as far as a favorite character, maybe Chris. Mm. You know, just sitting, watching birds, doing his thing. I like that. How about you? I had trouble figuring out a favorite character. Um, I definitely liked turtle a lot and i liked judge ford a lot and then but then when i was thinking about the teams i thought that it wasn't really a contest contest i really enjoyed angela and sidel yeah mm-hmm. i agree i think they're my favorite team oh they yeah i would i would say that they're a good team although i did i mean i liked turtle and um who was she with again it was flora the flora yeah i liked them just because you know Poor Turtle, her parents ignore her, and she finally gets the mother figure. So, of course, I, I felt for that. But, I mean, as far as Stella's hilarious, yeah. and, and the fact that she's the mistake is also kind of amazing that she wasn't a total dud. Right, yeah. She's the only one who trans who takes the notes on the will and everything. In mm-hmm. Polish. Yeah, in Polish. <laughs> Which, would that really work? I don't know. Um. I feel like it may be for a legal, but that's not really a legal document. No, it's just in the I mean, traditional sense. I mean, she just took, you know, she just took minutes and that's what her job was. So she knew she knows how to do it yeah. at the sausage company. <laughs> yes. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, Turtle's kind of my favorite character. Like, I've considered Tabitha Ruth as a name for, like, a future child. Oh, awesome. (laughs) But um, I do think it's interesting to think of the characters as pairings um, and, you know, how they relate to each other and how the pairings sort of bring them out of their, you know, respective shells I think is really great. Obviously everybody benefits from one another in some way. And they were obviously very strategically paired up for that purpose. Yeah. Although some of the things I kind of wonder, um, you know, they seem kind of accidental. Like, I don't know that, I don't know that Westing uh, would necessarily have predicted that Sidel and Angela would be like this power team. Um, But uh Right, like Turtle and and Flora. Like Turtle is looking, kind of looking for a mother, and Flora is kind of looking for a kid. Um, and even though, as kind of an individual person, like Flora, particularly early on, she just seems like kind of this wet character who um, isn't one of the more interesting ones. Although she develops as it goes on. Uh, and then, yeah, Chris, uh, you mentioned. Chris, like it's, I, I appreciate like Chris is just sort of in it for the adventure yeah. and like has all these interesting theories, but doesn't really seem to take it all that seriously necessarily. He's and, more just excited to have social interaction because people ignore him based on like, his disability have, so often. They let me play. Yeah. And everyone like, you know, I mean, a lot of the characters treat him basically like he has a mental disability at first. And then they figure out that he's actually really smart, which I think is, I think that's true. I believe, I believe that's how that actually works uh, (laughs) in real life, unfortunately. And then uh, the, the pairing of Grace Wexler and Shin Hu is one of those things that um, just works, ends up working a lot better than, even though they both, they don't exactly get along, but they end up being a good they're good sparring partners i guess you could say yeah and she has a lot of ideas about the restaurant that turn out to be good ideas and ends up taking it over i guess when he goes back to being an inventor who's on 10th <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> she's not so good with the naming <laughs> She got the first one but that's it yeah i if it becomes a like mcdonald's then it'll, you'll end up who's on Three three hundred thousand. She's an interesting character because I I remember her being a bad mother, but I didn't remember her being like a horrible racist, <laughs> even to her own husband. And it's sort of obvious that like Angela is sort of like the child that takes after her is like sort of the blonde Gentile, and Turtle obviously takes after like her Jewish father. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of like this dichotomy even in her own family. But she keeps saying these horrible things to everybody and then wondering why they're mad at her. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I 
copied down one example of that. Or, um, of course you did. Thank you. Of course you. I did. This is what I do. Grace tried again, her voice dripping with honey. You know, of course, that if I do win the inheritance, everything I own goes to Angela. This is in Turtle's bedroom. Which is a closet. Yeah. <laughs> what a shitty mom. Turtle bounded up. Let me out of here. A person can't breathe in this closet. She kicked the bed, kicked the chair, kicked the desk, and elbowed past the disapproving secretary. What in the world is wrong with that child, her mother said. Just completely oblivious. Constantly completely oblivious. And it's, you know, it's, but I like how Raskin wrote her and that she says and does these horrible things, but it's, and she doesn't understand what's going on, but it's a, very much the audience understands what's happening because sometimes you have these sort of offensive or difficult characters and it's not clear what the intention is with them from the author's standpoint, but it's obviously very clear that Raskin is like, look at this horrible woman. Let's all laugh at her, um, which is sort of nice in a way, even though, she, you know, you are getting this sort of uncomfortable dialogue, but it's nice to know that the author is, you know, definitely making a joke out of this person. It's a little comforting. Yeah, I agree. I feel like there's a lot of that. I feel like this is book is really playful. Uh, the writing, the way it's written, uh, which is another thing I like about it. Like, you know, it's set up pretty much from the beginning that the author is screwing with you, right? Yeah, I mean, the in the the prologue, it's like, hey, guess what? <laughs> this is a game, and here's how it's going to play out. One of them's a bomber, and one of them's a... So it's up to you to figure it out. But yeah, I mean, it definitely implied that, you know, the narrator was trying to... To fuck with you. Yeah. Which I like. I like being fucked with. That's right. <laughs> That's right, Carrie, you do. That's right. I know. <laughs> and it sets up also like these sort of little subsidiary m- mysteries that get resolved as the, as the things go on, you know, like who is Barney Northrup really, um, you know, who are the bomber and the burglar, et cetera. And, and you know, the, the whole burglar thing and the bomber, I'm just... First of all, Angela didn't really bomb anything. She just set off some fireworks inside. And She's an arsonist? <laughs> well, maybe a little more of an arsonist, but I don't know. The whole bomb, I was expecting like a bomb, but it was like, oh, this is a really pretty bomb. Uh-huh. I guess I, I wanted them to explore the mansion more on their own or, you know, have have the writer take us along with them because I was sort of interested in what on earth was going on in the mansion. It would make a good board game, you know, <laughs> sort of a la Clue. It really would. I would play this game. You play the Westing game. I would play the, Westing the mansion. Game. And one of the pieces is a little turtle. Well, I would hope so. A turtle and a crow. <laughs> a weather vane. Sure. I'm not sure what else we'd have. I guess a thimble for the dressmaker. Yeah, true. Uh, maybe a, a sneaker for the, um, was it Theo? No. It no. was uh, Doug. Doug was the runner. Doug was the runner. You could have a bird for Chris. Oh, yeah. And... <laughs> okay. So we're a basically. for Angela. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think we've done some good work here today. <laughs> yes, we have. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot about this book that I really like. And there's a lot of this book that. I like because it's nostalgic for me, but not because it holds up well. And I have to say that because, you know, not only would so much of this be different if it was written now, because everyone could just Google each other. There's no hiring, a, yeah. There's, you know, hire, hiring the, the private eye to, to snoop on everybody. And I think things would be so different were it written now. And a lot of that made it feel like, I'm I'm not as into it as I was when I was 12. And that's because it just doesn't hold up as well as I want it to. And maybe you guys would disagree, but for me, I felt like this was a little bit of a time capsule. I mean, it definitely had that feeling to me. And that doesn't mean I didn't still enjoy it. But I mean, even just some of the language is dated. Um, oh, yeah. Chris is described as crippled a lot, which I don't think would fly <laughs> now. Um, and a few other words that are just like, oh, I wouldn't have put it that way. Yeah, like um, his daughter. Yeah, things like that where it's that just, made me pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> I was like, I know it's it's 
it's just so nails on a chalkboard a little bit yeah. at this point. But I think I, I think as time goes on and we get sort of further away from what the era in which it was written, that maybe we'll be able to go back and look at it in more of a nostalgic but distanced way, the way we do with, you know, like a Nancy Drew novel or Agatha Christie or something, something that seems like a time very far removed. I think because it's from our childhood that it seems almost more dated than something that predates that. Yeah, it's not like picking up a Nancy Drew book and saying, oh, this is quaint. You're thinking, oh, this is uncomfortable. Maybe later right. it would be, oh, this is quaint. I don't know, but it could be. Yeah. We'll have to check in in 15 years and see what happens. Right. When I've forgotten the whole book all over again. I was thinking that if if Google existed when this book did uh, was written, then uh, the whole America the Beautiful reveal probably would have happened a lot earlier in the book. Oh, I would think so. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Maybe with just, a, you know, because everyone just had a couple of words and nobody was sharing. So maybe not. But, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that might have been a little different. Well, they would have known if it was the Bible or Shakespeare or <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right away. Like, oh, let's Google it. Let me just pull out my phone and figure that out. I also, you know, some... Like, I I feel like the, the the racial attitudes in the book are, you know, are generally, I, I don't have a problem with them, but um, the, like, Sun Lin Hu is such a cipher in the book uh, that bothered me a little. Why? Just because she, she was, you know, I feel like, well, like I said, I feel like the, um, one of the big strengths of the books is the characters and she is just like barely a character. You know, at the end you find out that she becomes an accountant and ends up running the, uh, shoe insert business. Um, but for most of it, she barely speaks and doesn't seem to have a whole lot of interior life. Like she has maybe a few sentences that from are from her point of view. Yeah. She doesn't really form into a, perspective character at all until like the last eighth of the book you know so it's it's sort of late going with her definitely but i mean she was also you know she didn't speak any english she she wasn't she didn't know what the hell was going on so i think it was sort of maybe on purpose to to make her not as as much of a character because she was removing herself from the situation. I mean, did she even show up to things? Uh, mostly not. Um, Jake went in there, every, I guess, every morning to try to teach her English. Yeah. But mostly, yeah, she didn't have, I mean, I guess since she didn't speak English, she couldn't. It is kind of creepy that she was 28 and her husband was 50. Yeah. And that he didn't seem to interact with her at all. She just kind of brought her over. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to make of all that. <laughs> it wasn't something I considered the first time I read it. No, you didn't think hmm, mail order bride. No. This time around, I was like, oh. So Turtle won. Yes. And one thing I, I thought was really interesting was that she didn't tell anybody she won. Right. Not even her husband. Not even her husband. She never told anybody. But I mean, maybe her parents were that clueless. But, you know. It's like, hey, mom and dad, I'm in my second year of college. Wonder how I'm paying for this. Like, they don't notice that their kid has a shit ton of money now. Well, does she? Th I mean, do well, they? She, she gets $5 million in the stock market. And they didn't, like, nobody thought it was a little suspicious that she eventually became the president of Westing Paper Products. Like, no one was like, why Turtle of all people is this close to the Westing name. No one, no one clued in. I guess that really bothered me. Like wouldn't, wouldn't judge Ford maybe have, have figured it out. Like, Hmm. Turtle seems really close to this Eastman guy. I bet the judge did figure it out. Okay. Well, and also didn't say anything. Yeah. I was more impressed by the fact that the judge's education to two Ivy League schools only cost $10,000. I know, right? 
I was like, well, <laughs> if anything makes this archaic, it's that. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even think about <laughs> that, but that is uh... – Damn. I'm like, that's that's a semester if you're lucky, if you're in state. <laughs> if you're in state, yeah. Not including books, room, and board. Oh, no, no. Do you think Westing knew that Judge Ford was just going to automatically sign her money over to Sandy? Or just guessed that she would? Because, I mean, when when you were saying, you know, people were paired up in, in, in the right way, that's what I was thinking was, oh, Westing must have known that she was going to do this for Sandy, thereby paying me back very possibly questing is kind of a godlike cr- creature in this book yeah. Um, oh, yeah he anticipates i mean he's a he's like a you know a master chess player so obviously he anticipates a lot of moves right like the uh the will you know reads like a script where there are places for other people to say things and they always <laughs> always say them well he also goes into the other room and edits it yeah but even at the beginning you yeah know, He's like, sit, sit down. down Grace Wexler. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Like, part of me thinks that he picked everyone because he knew that they would, you know, they would be good for each other, which is Chris's theory. Um, and then part of me thinks that he put people together kind of to see what would happen. So, so what do you what do you mean by that? Explain. Well, like he's handing these checks to all these people. So one of the questions is like. What are, how are people going to split them up? What are they going to do with them? Like, I don't know that he would necessarily, for instance, have predicted that Turtle and Flora weren't going to end up investing there. Yeah. Some people split the check. Other times they get signed over to just – so just one of them gets them. And then, um, you know, Chris and Dr. Denton, Chris refuses to sign at all. Theo, I think, signs it over to their parents. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's kind of like an experiment where you, you throw money at all these people and you see what they do. And, uh, you know, and it's, and that's one of the things that's interesting in the book is to see what each of them does with the money and what what each of them does with the clues. It's a prototype for reality television. I was thinking the same thing. I was just thinking the same thing that this is early reality TV. Right. And so the, the question is, you know, is Westing also like, is this an experiment for Westing too? And I, so that's part of me just thinks that he's doing this just to see how, People do. And then because another thing that I think is kind of interesting is at the beginning you get when people sign to show that they've received the uh, invitation to go to the will, Mm -hmm. they're asked to fill in their position. And then they then at the end, they're asked to do it again. And then but the second time when they when uh, the lawyer plum reads them Mm -hmm. out, uh, Westing has made some substitutions and some of that seems to be based on observations he's made. Like um, the second time Grace Wexler is identified as a restaurateur and Shin who as, as an inventor. Well, Angela goes from nun to person. Yeah. And it, it's, it's great that the doctor thinks she writes and you end. He's like, why did she mean nun? Does that mean I'm not getting any? Well, apparently he did not. <laughs> And then she went to person, which is uh, interesting. Oh, I have a very, very sad baby in the other room. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, my husband is taking care of him, but he is not happy about life. Didn't like the book. Hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you were in this game, how would you have played it? I like, you know, Sidel's method of watching other people. Yeah, I agree. Like, she was... Um, she and Theo, I thought, were kind of smart people who tried to play the game as it was kind of presented to them, Mm -hmm. you know, while the judge tried to figure out sort of what was behind it. And turtle had her own crazy theory. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it worked sort of. Yeah. She made $11,000. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I, I feel like my, um, my strength in mysteries, you know, which I not real life mysteries, obviously, but like when, if, <laughs> for example, um, when, uh, on the Simpsons, when there was the, who shot Mr. Burns, mm-hmm. I really had no idea what the answer was, but I read a bunch of theories and then I picked the right theory. So mm-hmm. my hope is that I would be paired up with someone who would have a bunch of theories and then I would be and like, you would mm-hmm. latch on to the right one. <laughs> that's my, that's how I flatter. That's how I flatter myself. <laughs> 
Carrie had to run off to take care of her baby, who was very unhappy. But Rachel and I are going to maybe talk about it a little while longer. Sure. So was there anything else um, that struck you about the book or that you liked or disliked? You know, now that I think about it, I almost want, like, the backstory in, like, a saga format, like the Westing saga <laughs> Of the whole family and the daughter and, you know, the drowning and sort of like a, you know, maybe a true detective element or, you know, something really, or or maybe like a, a gothic kind of nature, you know, something. I just feel like it would make a good back, like the backstory would make a good saga or a good mystery in some way. So that's almost something I, you know, I thought of this time around reading it that I would really like to see. Yeah. Um would be a Game of Thrones kind of thing. Yeah, but Violet Westing sounds like such a tragic character, and the whole thing with the the state senator who's in, you know, all these illegal doings and all that stuff. I just think could could actually be a lot of fun if if Raskin ever wanted to sort of revisit the topic, but do like a do a prequel. Mm-hmm. Did you ever read any of her other books? I don't think I have. I would have to like, go back and look at a list of other books she wrote, but none of them scream out to me that, you know, books of that I read around, you know, the nine to 12 years as being Ellen Raskin books, apart from this one. I think Figs and Phantoms has a bunch of kind of circus, circusy characters. And I remember, I think that's the one that has a guy you know who runs a business making hand lettered signs which are very beautiful and ornate except he has terrible spelling and he there's always at least one oh. terrible typo <laughs> on each sign that is so endearing <laughs> yeah and again a, a problem google would solve well i suppose so it would be did you mean and he'd be like yes <laughs> wait what i meant right someone would go around and write a little red squiggle under each word that would be the graffiti <laughs> So one thing that I thought was that I, I was a little confused by, I think the first time I read it when I was 15 or whatever, um, or younger than that, was uh, Turtle seems to really consider Sandy a, a friend, which I didn't think was entirely set up in the book. Um, on reading it again, I could see where it was set up a little more, but uh, I still feel like I could have wanted more, a little more there. But I think given like how neglected turtle is like anybody who was sort of like friendly with her and like talk to her at all she might have that connection with because so many people dislike her and so many people ignore her that anybody who like shows some warmth Mm -hmm. is going to probably register as a friend to her yeah i buy that um but it's also i mean because she doesn't I guess the only two characters that are Westing that she knows are Sandy, who she likes, but then uh, Barney Northrup, who she really dislikes. Um, so it's kind of interesting to me that she could, you know, that she would sort of latch on to the Sandy persona as being her friend and the person who she wanted to find again, despite the fact that he's kind of been living dishonestly and has this other character, you know, this other persona that, she doesn't care for it at all. And then she goes on to interact with the third persona who she feels almost doesn't – looks at her as if he doesn't know who she is, you know? Mm-hmm. There's like no – even though she knows it's the same person, she feels like there's no recognition. Yeah, it's it's a little awkward at first. So it's – you know, it's it's weird that it would be the same person and yet not have this relationship with him. And in wonder, I, you know, you wonder like which one – if any, he really was right. who was closest to, to his actual personality, and it's hard to say. Yeah, I know. I thought that was – I don't know. I that I had to think about that. Uh, it was because – right, particularly because he's also this kind of omniscient, godlike character. As, as right. Said. You know, you wonder – I mean, it could be that he antagonized her on purpose as Barney – you know, and so she would kick him. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have been all, you know, chess moves as part of everything. It's it's hard to know exactly how much he anticipated and how much he didn't. Obviously, anticipated a lot, but you know, something still went wrong. He couldn't have, 
you know, anticipated Sadell, obviously, because she was the mistake. So it's hard to say. Do we have anything else to say about it? I think that covers it on my end. All right. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this. I hope you had a good time. It was nice to revisit the book after so long. I had fond memories of it, so it was fun to go back and read it again. Yeah. I. Uh, it's definitely one of those books that you read as a kid, and then you wonder, was it really that good? But but I feel like it held up pretty well. It held up pretty well. It was you know a little dated. Some of the language was slightly uncomfortable. It, mm. it didn't come up too often. Um, not... It was, certainly wasn't unbearable in any way. But, yeah, I think uh, overall it does hold up. Next time we're going to talk about a book called Shiver, The Wolves of Mercy Falls Number 1 by Maggie Stiefvater, S-T-I-E-F-V-A-T-E-R. That name sounds made up, <laughs> uh, which came out in 2011. And that book is... Uh, it's something. <laughs> oh, that book. It's so bad. I love it. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible. It is terrible. I mean, it's it's well written. I'm not saying it's not, but it's all werewolves and shit. So that's not good. Yeah. Uh, I, re- I texted Carrie after I read the, the first chapter, which is two pages long. And I said, I think I could talk for 20 minutes about this book after re- <laughs> having read the first two pages. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now I'm intrigued. I'll have to listen in. Yeah. It's yeah. well, you absolutely should because I will swear a lot about that book because it is something else. So Carrie and I will be come back to talk about that. Oh, one feature of that book. So something that Carrie and I sometimes do on rare occasions is assign ourselves homework for books. Um, so in this one, the the one of the main characters, which spoiler alert, he's a werewolf. He's also a songwriter, uh, as am I. So I challenged Carrie to write some lyrics for a song, and I'll record it and uh, play it on that episode. But anyone out there who feels like writing a song on truffles, the candy, (laughs) in the persona of this wolf guy, uh, please do so and send it on in if you want. So you can contact us at on Facebook if you search for Love Ya Like Crazy, Love Y-A Like Crazy. Uh, you'll find us on Facebook. Um, we're also Love Y-A Pod on Twitter. I suppose at Love Y-A Pod. And you can send us an email at podcast at com. Thanks again. And I guess that's it. And we'll talk to you next time about Shiver. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there.